Okay. Welcome everyone to this presentation in the uh, of the Qualitative Methods Masterclass webinar series. I'm Ricardo Contreras uh, with Atlas TI, and I'm here with my colleague Yvette Magwat from IIQM, as well as Dr. Joseph Maxwell, who will be uh, presenting today's uh, uh, webinar. Uh, the Qualitative Methods Masterclass webinar series is a joint effort uh, between the International Institute of Qualitative Methodology at the University of Alberta, uh, the uh, University of Georgia Program of Interdisciplinary Qualitative Studies, and Atlas TI. So let me tell you a few things about, about the presentation. Uh, Dr. Maxwell, Maxwell will be presenting for about 40 minutes. Uh, while he is presenting, uh, you should feel free to write down your questions uh, using uh, the questions pane in the GoToWebinar control panel. So if you take a look at the control panel, you will see that it says questions. So you can practice now just by saying hello, and I will be able to read uh, what you write. So at the end of his presentation, uh, we are going to uh, read those questions and Dr. Maxwell will proceed to answer them. Your microphones remain muted throughout the presentation. Uh, otherwise, we would get background noise and echo, and that would make it very difficult for us to understand ourselves. So now I will, I will ask my colleague Yvette, Yvette Matwat from the International Institute for Qualitative Methodology to introduce Dr. Maxwell. Yvette? Thanks, Ricardo. Joseph Maxwell is a professor in the Research Methods Program in the College of Education and Human Development at George Mason University. His doctoral degree is in anthropology, but for the past 35 years, his research and teaching has been mainly in education and an increasing focus on methodology. He is the author of Qualitative Research Design, an Interactive Approach, and a Realist Approach for Qualitative Research, as well as articles on qualitative and mixed methods research, Native American societies, and medical education. His current research deals with using qualitative methods for casual explanation, validity, cool in qualitative and quantitative research, the history and breadth of mixed methods research, and the value of philosophic realism for research, and the importance of diversity and dialogue across research paradigms and methods. Thank you very much for being with us here. Thank Today. you, Yvette. I will now uh, make you the presenter, uh, Dr. Maxwell, so you will see uh, that a message will pop up on your screen, and you just click where it says show my screen it says show okay main screen okay and show my screen got it okay and then i just have to you have to you have to click where it says yes, show. It's, yes. So start that's right start, start right. yes and there got we it. go and we are okay so now please go ahead with your presentation okay do i need do i need to close the webinar control panel no Keep it open, no. just the way. I, I, just go ahead. But can every can everyone see the full slide? Because it everybody blocks. sees the full slide. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um. Sorry, if, if it's um. Introduction of me. There must have been a typo in there. It's not casual explanation. It's causal explanation. <laughs> and I will talk about that at some length during my presentation. Um. The title of my presentation is Realism and Qualitative Research. A, I'm, I'm drawing substantially from my book, A Realist Approach for Qualitative Research, which goes into much more detail on some of the topics that I will be talking about. But the first thing I need to do is to talk about what I mean by realism. Um, is it, I'm sorry, the, the control panel is blocking. I can, if I can move that off to this, there, got it, okay. De the philosopher and methodologist Dennis Phillips said, Philo philosophic realism in general is, quote, the view that entities exist independently of our being perceived or independently of our theories about them. Um, Tom Schwant, whoops, I got to get back onto this. In the Sage Dictionary of Qualitative Research said, scientific realism is the view that theories refer to real features of the world. Reality here refers to whatever it is in the universe, forces, structures, and so on, that causes the phenomena we perceive with our senses. 
Now, this is the position that, let me go back, this is the position that seems, you know, pretty much common sense. Um, it's also a position that's um, held by probably a majority of philosophers of science these days. Hagen ever was in their book, Realist and Korean Social Science, and although realism in some form or other is a tacit philosophy of any working scientist and is endorsed by the majority of professional philosophers of science, it does not figure prominently in methodological discussions and research practices in the social sciences. So that's, that's the issue that I'm really addressing here. Why is it that realism has not played a more prominent role in talking about methodology? Um, this is, realism has been promoted by a substantial number of prominent qualitative researchers, starting back with Herbert Bloomer, the, the originator of the concepts of symbolic interactionism, uh, Matt Miles and Michael Huberman in their book, um, Qualitative Data Analysis, um, Martin Hammersley and Tom Schwant, who I quoted earlier on realism. Um, but, when qualitative researchers in particular talk about these issues, their position has been largely anti-realist. Um, and it's encouraged, it's encouraged the idea, as Hagen ever say, that there's a sharp split between quantitative and qualitative research and they're fundamentally different paradigms that inform each of those and that realism is the paradigm for quantitative research and some kind of constructivism or anti-realism is the paradigm for qualitative research. Um, now, Schwann criticized this basically saying I mean, in a common sense basis, uh, most of us probably believe in garden variety empirical realists. That is, we act as if the objects in the world exist as independent in some way from our experience with them. Um, we, when our cars don't start, we think there is a real problem there that a mechanic can diagnose and fix. Um, we also, he taught, Schwann said, we also regard society, institutions, feelings, intelligence, poverty, disability, and so on as being just as real as the toes on our feet and the sun in the sky. Dr. Um, Yes. Uh, let me interrupt you for just a second. Sure. Uh, uh, sometimes we hear some uh, uh, some noise. It seems to be that uh, maybe you're touching some papers or something like that, so that uh, could be hear okay. a noise uh, uh, when you talk. I will. Okay, I will try not to to move my notes okay. that I'm talking from them. Okay. okay. Thank you very let much. me know if this. Let me know if the problem persists. And okay. We'll see. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so to talk about why this has been a problem in qualitative research, that despite the prominence of realism in philosophy, most qualitative researchers have rejected realism, I need to talk about um, the distinction between ontology and epistemology. Ontology is the branch of philosophy that deals with the nature of being, what actually exists, what, what is the nature of the world. Um, Epistemology is the branch of philosophy that deals with what we can know, how we understand what exists, how do we gain knowledge of the world, or what the world that ontology, whatever your ontology says, actually exists. Um, ontological realism, as some previous quotes said, there's a real world that exists independently of our perceptions and theories and constructions. But most contemporary realists are not epistemological realists, they are epistemological constructivists. They believe that our understanding of this world is inevitably a construction from our own perspectives and standpoints, and that there, and, and that there may be multiple valid constructions that each capture some part of this real world. Um, now, Lakoff, George Lakoff, the philosopher and linguist, said scientific realism assumes that, quote, the world is the way it is while acknowledging that there can be more than one scientifically correct way of understanding reality in terms of conceptual schemes with different objects and categories and objects. And I, I go into this issue in much more detail in my book, A Realistic Approach for Qualitative Research. Um, but what happened starting in about 1980 or so was 
what has been called the paradigm wars between qualitative and quantitative research. And I think that's, that's what is mostly behind the rejection of realism by qualitative researchers. Um, so first I need to talk about what, what a paradigm is. Uh, Thomas Kuhn basically coined the term, well, Kuhn and um, Paul Feyerabend and independently. But Kuhn said, paradigm is a set of beliefs and practices that characterize a particular scientific community and guides its work that's often embodied in exemplary research studies. And one of the claims that, that Kuhn made about paradigms is that paradigms are incommensurable. That is, there are different paradigms in the classic work of Kuhn's, the, um, the Copernican Revolution, he talked about the paradigms of Ptolemaic and Copernican astronomy, said it's impossible to translate one into the other into some kind of neutral language so that you can logically compare the two and decide which is correct. Paradigms are different all the way down. It's, there is no possibility of a neutral language for this. Um, now this concept got, I would say, distorted, it got modified substantially in, during the paradigm wars um, with you know, the rise of quantitative research and the reaction to that by qualitative researchers to mean incompatibility that a different paradigms were incompatible and because qualitative research and quantitative research were founded on different paradigms there was no way to put the two together or even to have a you know a um, productive discussion between the two paradigms um, which led quantit qualitative researchers to reject much of what um, realists um, claimed. Um, so I need to talk a little bit about positivism because positivism was what qualitative researchers assumed was the paradigm for quantitative research. And there's been major misunderstanding about logical positivism, and I don't want to try to clear up some of that. The key features of logical positivism was that theoretical terms need to be defined operationally in terms of the methods that were used to investigate them and the actual data that these methods produced. Um, so that the, the idea here was that science could be placed on a firm foundation of irrefutable sense data. Because of this, positive has denied the reality of theoretical entities. They basically said, you know, concepts like atoms, black holes, quarks, and so on were metaphysical and no proper topic of science. They were simply logical constructions that can be defined in terms of sense data. Um, as a result, they, their, their definition of causation that they used was David Hume's regularity definition of causation, which is causation simply is the regular association of variable A and variable B. That it's what we can directly observe. There's nothing behind that. There is no mysterious, unobservable process that causation involves. As a result, you could then build up a logically deductive system of laws and create a unified science with a single standardized language. Um, well, unfortunately, about 1950, all of this came under severe criticisms from philosophers and was pretty much demolished. Um, you couldn't do that. There was no way to logically make um, theoretical terms simply be based on sense data. Um, and as a result, logical positivism collapsed and people tried to salvage what they thought was valuable from it in what is now termed post-positivism. Um, and the philosopher A.J. Ayer, whose book Language, Truth, and Logic sort of introduced logical positivism to the English-speaking world, I was, it was still used as a textbook in philosophy courses when I was an undergraduate, eventually said, I suppose the main defect of it was that nearly all of it was false. <laughs> so logical positivism is no longer a viable contender 
in terms of possible philosophical stances for research. Uh, now, despite that, there's still a, 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 an influence of positivistic ideas that has been retained particularly in quantitative research. Um, and that has continued to reinforce this divide between quantitative and qualitative research. And what I want to argue is that a realist approach to ontology and epistemology can help bridge that gap and resolve some of these problems. Uh, now, one of the reasons that positivism reject, was rejected by quantitative researchers was they saw it as essential materialist, of saying, you know, the only reality is material. It rejected the whole idea of meaning and mind as a, appropriate concepts for research, for investigation, except in terms of a, a kind of a positivistic approach. Um, and as a result, Lincoln and others, Google and Lincoln particularly, um, advocated that if you're a naturalist or constructivist, naturalist was the term that they used for their um, original ap approach to qualitative research, brought about the irrelevance of the distinction between ontology and epistemology. That if you have a constructivist epistemology, there is no way that ontology can be um, relevant to what we do. Everything is epistemology. Um, and so um, John Smith, for example, in a critique of um, various realist, realist approaches by me and by Martin Hammersley, ended up saying that there's no way to use ontology that doesn't come up against the barriers of epistemology, and Maxwell is unable to show us how to get reality to do some serious work. Uh, so, um, now I think this isn't true. And I think that, in fact, as Karate says in, in his widely used book, Foundations of Social Research, realism and ontology and constructivism and epistemology, epistemology turn out to be quite compatible. The reason that ontology can be relevant, despite a constructivist epistemology, is the possibility of testing our ideas, of taking our theories or our conclusions and asking, okay, what data might there be that could support or challenge these ideas, and what alternative possible theories or conclusions might be possible alternatives to ours. Now, this is, the, this is a basic idea of science, the idea of testing your theories. But it turns out to be, you, you can do that despite the fact that you're, your epistemology is constructivist. By, because it's possible for you to find out that you're wrong. It's possible to, to, to discover that your theory, in fact, does not do a good job of explaining your data. Um, also, so the key issue, a key issue here is, an, is the issue of causality. And that's, what I, that's really what I'm going to focus on because I think it's one of the main implications of realism. And the issue, and the, 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 what this depends on is the fact that the positivist theory of causation was seriously flawed. The idea that causation, I mean, some positivists from Bertrand Russell to Fred Gerlinger, um, said that the idea of cause should be ruled out of science. It was a metaphysical concept that had no place in scientific discourse. Um, what most positives did was they simply tried to define causation in terms of observable relationships between variables. But in philosophy, over the last 30 years or so, realist philosophers have been developing an alternative concept of causality. Um, 
as in contrast to David Hume's concept. This is the regularity theory that we can't directly perceive causal relationships. Thus, we can have no knowledge of causality beyond, beyond the observed regularities. Um, now, a realist concept of causality is that causality consists not of regularities, but of real and, in principle, observable causal mechanism processes, which may or may not produce regularities. Um, and this, is, this has gotten a lot of attention and is being developed substantially in various fields. Political science is a particularly important one, um, working on what they call process tracing, um, trying to discover what are the processes behind the observable regularities that they see in political phenomena. Um, and I've been arguing for a realist concept of causality for some time. So Andrew Sayer in Method and Social Science, a Realist Approach, it's much has been written about methods of explanation that assumes that causation is a matter of regularities, and without models of regularities, we're left with allegedly inferior ad hoc narratives. Social science has been singularly unsuccessful in discovering wall-like regularities. They simply do not exist in the social sciences. Um, physics has wall-like regularities because there's a sense of an essential uniformity across many of the phenomena that physicists study. Proton is a proton, no matter where and when it is. Um, this is this is the, what allows physicists to come up with concepts like Newton's laws. Is this essential regularity? This regularity does not exist in the social sciences or even really in biology. Um, there's you know. As Sayer says, social science has been singularly unsuccessful in discovering law-like regularities. One of the main achievements of recent realist philosophy has been to show that this is an inevitable concept or an erroneous view of causation. Um, this distinction fits very nicely with the distinction that the um, evaluation researcher Larry Moore called the distinction between variance theory and process theory. Variance theory, which is largely captures the way many quantitative researchers think, is to see the world in terms of variables and on the relationships among variables. If you can't think in terms of variables, identify variables, correlate them, and so on, you can't do quantitative research. That's what it fundamentally involves. And causal explanation in quantitative research consists in showing an irregular relationship between variables. Um, process theory which is Moore's alternative to this, is to see the world in terms of entities and events and the processes that connect these. An explanation consists of showing a coherent process by which some entities and events influence others. Now this is a theory of causation that is far more compatible with qualitative research than the regularity theory the quantitative researchers typically use. Um, and it has important implications for social research. If causation can be directly observed or credibly inferred from observations, it can be observed or inferred in single cases rather than requiring comparison of situations in which the presumed cause is present or absent. That is, single case studies of qualitative researchers can identify causal processes without having a, quote, control group to which you compare the different variables to see if they are differently related to some presumed cause. The second implication is that context is intrinsically involved in causal processes in a way that can't simply be reduced to a set of extraneous variables. Um, this point has been made very strongly by the evaluation researcher Ray Pawson, who says, I, I didn't have a slide for this, but his formula is um, mechanism in context leads to the outcome. The context is part of the causal process and can't be extracted or um, isolated from that causal process in a way that allows us to understand what's going on. And then third, mental events and processes are real phenomena that can be the causes of behavior. This, this idea that mind and body are completely separate and not interacting in some important way goes back to Max Weber and others and the distinction between causal and causal explanation and interpretive explanation. Um, but recent 
advances in realist philosophy have challenged that. Um, my main source here is the, is the philosopher Hilary Putnam. I didn't think to create a slide on this, whose book on the threefold coin, mind, body, and world, develops a theory of mind that says mind is real, but it's understood by means of a different set of concepts, a different theoretical framework from physical phenomena. So that there's no incompatibility between the two, there are simply two different ways of looking at the world, mind and brain. Um, and that thus it's possible for mental events and processes to influence physical ones and vice versa. The um, psychologist Bandura said, what people think, believe, and feel affects how they behave. The natural and expensive effects of their actions in turn partly determine their thought patterns and effective reactions. This is just common sense. This is something we all accept in our everyday lives, that our beliefs about things influence what we do and thereby influence the world. Conversely, what happens in the world influences how we think and how we act. Um, but for some reason, qualitative researchers on philosophical grounds found it impossible to simply accept this common sense understanding of the interaction of mind and, wor and body and world. Um, which I don't completely understand why that happened, but it, it's, it, it has been very prevalent. Um, one of the um, students whose dissertation was a finalist for the Qualitative Dissertation Award by the American Educational Research Association Qualitative Research SIG some years ago confided to me that she thought that uttering the word cause in qualitative circle was akin to invoking evil spirits. Uh, so, what I wanted to do now is just to review what I think some of the main advantages for a realist approach are for qualitative research. First, as I've been describing, meaning and mind are just as real as physical objects and processes. They are interacting with physical objects and processes, and no valid understanding can ignore this interaction. It is important to consider mental processes, beliefs, values, motivations, and so on, as part of the causal processes that cause the behavior we can observe. And I think that this approach, sorry, I need to go back. Sorry, a realist theory of causation is quite compatible with qualitative research. These are mental events are real phenomena and causal process can be identified and verified using qualitative methods. A third point, because I'm, I'm going to running short of time and I don't want to go into in great detail, is that diversity is a real phenomenon. I'm arguing, I argue this at length in my book, A Realist Approach for Qualitative Research, um, that both quantitative and qualitative methods have inherent biases toward finding uniformities and ignoring diversity. In quantitative research, this stems substantially from a focus on mean values, averages, and ignoring either the, the range of diversity or simply categorizing that as a variable, as a variance, um, and putting a number over it. Um, there's a detailed critique of this in a book by um, Todd Rose called The End of Average, in which he devastatingly critiques the whole process by which this concept of average gained such prominence in qualitative research and how it led to the ignoring of diversity, which has substantial deleterious effects in education and medicine and lots of other places. Um, and as I said, I talk about this at more length in my book, although I, you know, Todd Rose's book came out after that book was published, and I'll incorporate that in the next edition of my, my book. <clears throat> Finally, I want to talk a bit about validity as a concept. Validity as a concept was pretty much rejected by qualitative researchers 
many qualitative researchers, along with their rejection of positivism and causation, um, because they saw it as too intrinsically connected to a positivist or objectivist understanding of research. Um, and one of the key points that has come out, which is, is quite compatible with a realist approach, but is not necessarily directly drawn from that, is the idea that validity is not a property of methods, it's a property of the actual inferences that you draw from using the methods in a particular context for a particular purpose. And this cuts across, across measurement, across quantitative research and qualitative research. I think it is a growing consensus within all of those fields. Shadish Cook and Campbell in their definitive book on experimental and quasi-experimental design said validity is a property of inferences. It is not a property of designs or methods for the same designs may contribute to more or less valid inferences under different circumstances. No method guarantees the validity of an inference. And this is highly compatible with their distinction between causal description and causal explanation. Um, that causal explanations are what you need to assess the validity of, and that cannot be done simply by referring to methods that were used. Um, and this is a this is a substantial critique of the whole approach to um, what's called evidence-based practice or science-based research, which tends to um, influence the the way in which research methods are ranked in, with randomized controlled experiments at the top um, and quasi-experiments and other things at lower levels of qualitative research at the absolute bottom. And I wrote a paper that was a critique of the National Research Council's um, book on scientific research and education showing how their conclusions implicitly assumed a positivist understanding of causality and thus denigrated qualitative research on the basis of that and why a realist approach to causation gives us a much better understanding of what qualitative research can contribute to causal explanations in the social sciences and in medicine for that matter. Um, so um, another quote to, which I particularly like this is it goes back you know almost 40 years. Um, validity is not a commodity that can be purchased with techniques. Rather, validity is like integrity, character, and quality to be assessed relative to purposes and circumstances. Context and purposes matter in terms of assessing validity. Well, the problem is, if validity is not something that you can be assessed by simply looking at the methods that were used and deciding whether they were rigorous and valid or not, how do you assess validity? This realist stance says that there can be no generic criteria for definitively assessing validity, no checklist of characteristics or procedures that can be used to adequately evaluate a study in terms of the credibility or trustworthiness of its conclusions. You cannot read an article, simply look at what methods were used and say, oh, this is a valid study or it's not a valid study. Now, of course, methods are relevant to validity. Um, but they do not determine the validity of a conclusion. You have to ask, does this conclusion accurately represent the phenomenon being studied? And to do that, you have to ask what other possible alternative theories or explanations might do a better job or might challenge the credibility of your theory. So as I, as I said earlier, qualitative researchers mostly rejected the concept of validity because they understood it as being essentially positivist. What I'm trying to do, and what in fact the people quoted here are trying to do, is to reframe the concept of validity in realist terms in a way that can be relevant for both qualitative and quantitative research. So in my book on qualitative research design, I talk about validity as an actual part of your research design and how you can assess the validity of your conclusions using um, methods that test those in terms of possible alternative explanations. Um, so 
How do you do that? Basic feature of science, again, the ability to test and rule out alternative explanations or validity threats. And all these validity threats are just basically alternative possible ways of explaining your results. I'm, say you're doing an interview study. Was the interviewee telling you the truth? That's an alternative possible explanation for what they said. Were your own biases causing you to select certain things that they said and ignore others to create a distorted conclusion about their beliefs? Um, was the participant themselves not completely unaware of why they were doing things and was giving what's called self-report biases to their account? Um, there are lots of other ways that you might you might have come up with um, invalid conclusions and you have to think about and I, in my book on qualitative research design has a, a long list of possible strategies that you can use to assess the validity of your results in a qualitative study um, and that's as far as my slides go um, to summarize um, I think that realism is a very useful way of thinking about qualitative research. It, I think, is completely compatible with our everyday practices in terms of how we deal with the world. Um, and I think it would be possible for a realist perspective to bring our methodological principles and practices in line with what we do in our everyday lives. Um, so I think I will now open this up for questions. Um, Thank you, uh, Dr. Maxwell. Let me ask you a favor. Could you please go back to click on uh, uh, slideshow from current slide or from start? Yeah. Because we see now your, your emails in the back. But now it is okay. Okay, thank okay. you. So let me see if, if, if we have uh, questions here and I will uh, read them out loud, but I will also uh, try to give the microphone to those who want to speak. So just a second, please. Let me, sure. let me see here. Let me see. I, I lost my questions section in, in my control panel. Okay, here it is. So now, now I can... Technology. Yes, I know. Okay, now let me let me take a look here at some of the questions people have asked. Uh, first one here is uh, Pamela. Pamela, she said, "Well, you mentioned Hillary, someone. What was the last name of that researcher?" Oh, sorry, Hillary Putnam. P U T N A M, and the book is called "The Threefold Chord: Mind, Body, and World." Okay. I think that is that to to my mind is the most credible theory of the relationship between mind and body. Okay, I will now uh, I will now attempt to give the, uh, the, 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 the 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 microphone to Katrina. She has a question, uh, and I prefer that she read out loud if she tells her what she means. So, Katrina, your microphone is now open. Go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, very yes. good. Hi. Um, uh, so my name is Katrina Plamondon. I'm uh, situated in Kelowna, BC, and a uh, doctoral student at University of British Columbia. And I'm just curious, I, I've thought about this quite a bit in, um, my background is in nursing, and mm -hmm. I've had conversations with other colleagues about this, but I wonder what you think about the culture of academia and how much that might inf have influenced the rejection of realism, in particular um, <clears throat> the sort of need to define a discipline as extremely distinct from others and, um, and to have our own unique turf, if this contributed in some way to the rejection of realism as qualitative research and quantitative research sort of ran this battle between who is more legitimate. Hmm. Um, I think it probably played some role, but I don't think it was necessarily the dominant one, because I'm, I've I've done some historical research on 
mixed method research. And in fact, I mean, you know, a lot of my work these days is, is on mixed method research and combining qualitative and quantitative. Qualitative and quantitative methods were combined for many years. I mean, going back to um, W.E.B. Du Bois's Philadelphia Negro in 1899. Um, and there was no sense of incompatibility there. Um, this has continued through, you know, classic community studies. Um, um, Yankee City, Marienthal, um, and others in the 1920s and 30s, um, and into the 40s and 50s. It was only with the, the increasing dominance of quantitative research in terms of prestige and funding. Mm long about the 1960s and 70s that led to the sense by qualitative researchers that they needed to reject a lot of the positivistic assumptions that informed that and create an alternative framework that justified their own research. And unfortunately, I think they, they picked the wrong framework to do that. Um, and and I think, and I think you're right that this sense of, of disciplinary identity has, since that time, played a, a significant role in the separation. Um, I've been encouraged by the growth of mixed method research and the many people who are saying, "Now, look, we can have a, a valid integration of these two that values both of them, that sees them as complementary rather mm -hmm. than as conflicting." But the but the you know forces and you know evidence based research are still pushing the idea that quantitative research is real research, and quantitative qualitative research is simply anecdotal and you know unscientific. Mm -hmm. So can I just ask, what do you think sure. contributed to such a rise in prestige of quantitative research as the gold standard? How what sparks well, that? Well, I. I, I think right. Well, I mean, an increasing statistical sophistication um, played a major part of that, and the ability to claim that their results were, you know, rigorous. I mean, this is. I, I, I'll, I'll just mention this. I don't have time to go into it in detail, but a lot of that. Uh, there's the problem was that the development of inferential statistics was. You know, featured in a major controversy between Fisher and um, Neyman and Pearson, who had developed different models and you know vituperatively fought about who was right. And people who just wanted to get their work done sort of mushed the two together in a way that was fundamentally incompatible. And we're now seeing the results of this in terms of what's called the crisis of replicability in um, psychology and medicine, where studies with highly significant p-values have been published and then later found not to replicate. And the mm -hmm. problem is that people, most researchers misunderstand what a p-value actually tells you. It does not tell you the probability that your results will replicate or that they are due to chance. Um, statisticians have been railing about this for years, but they're finally getting an audience because it's having serious financial consequences. People fund studies for millions of dollars that don't replicate. I, I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> it's very fascinating to me and I really appreciate I the the historical context is very interesting and um, gives me lots to think about. So thank you very much for your presentation. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have a lot of questions that are coming up. So uh, uh, we have to be short in 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 in, in uh, uh, when asking the questions, but also uh, um, in the answers. So now I will I will ask uh, Shu Long if he can ask uh, her or his question. Let me see here. I will open your microphone now. Go ahead. Hey, uh, thanks, Dr. Maxwell, very much. And I, I at the end of your presentation, you talk about the validity threats. Mm -hmm. and and um, do you have any recommendations for uh, researchers? Uh, how can we uh, reduce the validity threats because we cannot totally eliminate that, right? So how can you use um, any strategies to uh, reduce the possibility or, you know, be more aware of that? Thank you. 
Okay, well, I mean, you, you framed it exactly right. There's no way to absolutely rule out possible validity threats. The, the, the standard here is to make them implausible beyond a reasonable doubt, to make them unlikely enough that you can say, I, I really don't think this is what was going on. Um, there's, there's all kinds of ways to do that. I talk about them in much more detail in my qualitative research design book. Uh, they, but basically, they all involve saying, and then it's the title of the chapter in the book, how might you be wrong? What are the possible ways that your conclusions might be an error? And how can you test that? How can you find? How, one of the things to, to do is to look for discrepant data, to look for data that doesn't fit your theory, and say, okay, how serious the problem is this? Does this suggest that I may really be off base with my conclusions? Um, there are lots of there are lots of other ways of doing it. Um, I can't go into them all in detail, but it's a, it's I, it's fundamentally a matter of. Seriously, you know, taking seriously the possibility that you might be wrong, asking yourself what are the possible ways I might be wrong, and it's you know, research should be a social process, not an individual one. It's not just a matter of you thinking of it, but showing your conclusions to colleagues and saying, do you see any places where I might be off base here? I think that's that's as much as I can say in a nutshell. Thank you. I will now give the microphone to Lori. Uh, Lori. Uh, you have to click on the microphone icon. Okay, okay now, go ahead, Lori. Hi, Dr. Maxwell. It's a great pleasure to hear from you directly. Um, my question um, involves a comparison. Uh, I know that mixed method study is an area that you look into a lot, and many of the researchers writing about a philosophical stance come from a pragmatist background. Mm -hmm. And when I compare your uh, description of critical realism in the qualitative sense mm -hmm. with their description of pragmatism, other than the, you know, sort of staunch holding on to that ontological Mm -hmm. uh, multiple area. I don't see a lot of difference between those two. Is there something you can help me to understand better about that difference? Yeah, I can. Well, I, first I want to say that I don't think the different philosophical stances are sort of completely separate and incompatible approaches. There's a lot that pragmatists um, agree on that is, you know, quite compatible with realism. I mean, the the founder of American pragmatism, Charles Peirce, was a philosophical realist as well as a pragmatist. Um, so, I, yeah, I've you know I've encountered this particularly in the context of mixed method research because a majority of mixed method research I think think see pragmatism as sort of the correct paradigm for mixed method research, and I've opposed that. I, I wrote a paper. Um, called Paradigms or Toolkits. It was published in the Midwestern Educational Researcher a couple years back, where I said, look, paradigms are not unique, intrinsically unified stances that you have to choose one or the other and reject the others. You can use them as different tools. You can take a real stance and look at it through that lens. You can take a pragmatist stance and look at it through that lens, and they show you different things. So. I'm, I'm in favor of lots of different philosophical stances as tools in a toolkit, rather than as, quote, foundations for research. I, I, does that answer your question? <laughs> Thank you. We will have to move on because the list okay. of questions are, is very long. So now I will give the microphone to Marcia. Marcia, would you go ahead and... Uh, my question is, um, from a historical sp perspective, you seem to suggest that realism is more often thought of in terms of sort of positivism. Um, By qualitative research. Uh, in the, that sort of Hello? Yes. By qualitative researchers? Yes. Uh, yeah. So many, I teach a class where I have a lot of students who assume that critical realism is tantamount to realism, and furthermore, they think that realism is primarily qualitative, whereas in, in this presentation, you seem to be sort of arguing for bringing realism to qualitative rather than assuming that it was already qualitative. So I was wondering if you can explain why 
in historical terms or whatever your rationale is, is for thinking that many people already see realism as more towards the quantitative end of the spectrum. Well, it, I mean, it goes back to the rejection of, of, of positivism, which many qualitative researchers equated with realism. Um, and Egon Guba and Ivana Lincoln were sort of you know, in the forefront of this and essentially rejected the idea that there was a real world independent of our constructions. I mean, they were, they were very explicit about this. Um, and that has been taken up and had, has profound influence on the development of qualitative research. I mean, you know, I, I don't know, I, I gave a talk a few years back on the importance of qualitative research for causal explanation in, in education. Um, Ivana Lincoln was one of the discussants, and she actually said at some point, I never denied that there was a real world. But she did deny that there was a real world. Or she and Egan Guba did deny that there was a real world. That was, you know, that existed independently of our constructions of it. Um, so I think that's partly what's going on. The term critical realism is also potentially problematic, and I may, I don't know if I want to keep using that term because it's often re refers specifically to the work of Roy Baskar and his associates in the UK. Um, and many of the people whose views of realism I'm incorporating are rejecting the, the, the more recent version of, of Rasker, Baskar's dialectical critical realism. Um, but there are, there are realists, particularly in Europe, that are using critical realism in qualitative research. I have seen very little of it in the United States so far. Martin Hammersley and I are really the, the main people who've been advocating um, realism as specifically a stance for qualitative research. I, I'm getting off track here. I mean, I don't know if I'm answering your question or not. Thank you, Dr. Maxwell. Let, 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 let's move on so that the other people can also uh, ask questions. Rachel, I will give you the microphone. Uh, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for a great presentation. Um, my question is around the way that realism is getting a hold within our fields and the way that Ray Porson's work is tending now to dominate thinking in this area. Well, I'm um, glad to hear that. <laughs> but, but, it, but in the sense that Ray's model is the only approach to realism that oh. journals and reviews are now accepting, I wondered what advice you might have in terms of recovering or reclaiming the broader field or the broader perspectives of realism without getting stuck again in yet another paradigm more about whose model of realism yeah. is right. Yeah, I, I pretty much agree with most of what Pawson is saying, but he's, you know, there are, there are other, Martin Hamsley is the, the other person in the UK, I think, whose, whose work is, is really important and sort of widely recognized. But they, they may be talking to different audiences because Boston is mainly talking about you know about program evaluation, um, not about methodology specifically. Um, but I, you know I I see Pawson Pawson has certainly been one of the major influences on my own thinking about a realist approach, and I don't I don't disagree with him on most of this stuff. But I I do think it's important to to be looking at what other people have said as well and who, you know, elaborate on methodological implications that Pawson hasn't explicitly addressed. Thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Aparna if, if you can uh, 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 say your question out loud. Go ahead. Aparna, your microphone is open. Okay, so I will I will move on to another person. I will ask Juan Cruz. Juan Cruz, uh, let me see if you can uh, if you can uh, say uh, speak your, your, your question out loud. So here it is. Open your microphone, Juan. Go ahead. Hello, hi, Dr. Maxwell. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, my first question will have to be will have to do with more with uh, methodology. I was wondering if you could talk more about research design um, or choosing a methodology using a realist approach on qualitative research. Yeah, sure. Well, I, I, I've written a book about that. You know, uh, 
on qualitative research design, which is implicitly, I mean, I don't talk much about realism in the book, but it's implicitly realist. My model of research design, what I call an interactive model, um, I could also have called it a systemic model, is very different from most of the views of research design that are out there in the literature, which are either forms of, you know, you have to choose a design, um, like an experimental research, you choose a particular design and then just follow that faithfully. Um, uh, John Creswell talks about choosing among five different sort of philosophical approaches for research, or a logical steps model of design where you do A, B, C, D, and E in some kind of logical order, um, which often matches the structure of a research proposal. You know, you've got your philosophical foundations, your literature review, your research questions, your methods, your conclusions, your validity issues, and so on. Um, my model is interactive and it says that, that all of these are important components but they interact with one another. They each mutually influence each other. Sometimes what you find out in your um, research causes you to change your research questions or change your theoretical framework. It's not a fixed thing that once you do it, it's just part of the design. In this sense, my model is not just a model for research. It's not a recipe or a cookbook for how to do research, but it's a model of your study. And you have to keep thinking about, you know, what, what, what am I really trying to find out? Um, what is actually going on when I'm doing my data collection? Um, and address that, the way, that and the way it affects other parts of the design. So I, that's my interactive concept of research design is basically how I think about um, research design as an issue in qualitative research. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we will not be able to answer all of the questions. We have about seven already uh, still that have not been answered. Uh, but I was wondering if uh, if I sent to you those questions, would you be able to uh, uh, answer them by email? Uh, just a few. Absolutely. Seconds? Yes. Yes. Okay. So all of all of those uh, all of you uh, who have not had your answer your questions answers answered, don't worry. Uh, we will have those answers. So what I will do now is I will ask uh, Yvette Marquardt from IIQM to say a few words. Yvette, uh, let me, uh, please go ahead, Yvette, and I will also, as you do that, I will show the, um, the screen of the IIQM uh, Institute so that people can see what is coming up. Uh, go ahead, please. Thank you very much, Ricardo, and thank you very much, Dr. Maxwell, for that wonderful presentation. Um, we've got the, coming up in June, we have the Thinking Qualitatively workshop series, and you can check that out and register. Registration is now open. You can submit your poster abstracts, www.iaqm.ualberta.ca. As well, we will be continuing with the monthly webinars. Um, we're still trying to, um, I believe the next one is March 16th with Dawn Kingston at 2 p.m. Um, so hopefully we'll see you all there. Yes, and... Uh after that, we have a few more, but more will be coming. And uh, the one after in, on April the 20th will be Fostering Culturally Responsive Evaluation Practice by Jory Hall and Melissa Freeman. Uh, so uh, we are all, you're all welcome to, to come to these presentations. And uh, I want to ask uh, Dr. Maxwell if you have any final uh, words before we say goodbye. Um. I, no. <laughs> I, aside from repeating what I already said, I don't think I have anything final words. Um, I hope this has been helpful to you. Um, I'm not I'm, I'm not in line with my overall approach to the relevance of philosophy for qualitative research. I'm not saying realism is the correct paradigm for qualitative research. I'm saying realism is a useful set of um, ideas and stances for qualitative research that can have some interesting and important implications for how we do qualitative research and how we assess the value of our conclusions. Thank you very, very much. Uh, just let me add that the, the, uh, the video of this presentation will be available um, on the on, on the IIQM website, what I'm showing you now. So you have to go to archived research uh, webinars, I'm sorry, and that is where you are going to see 
the slide show as well as the video. So we, we, we hope that you can come to the uh, following presentations. Uh, the success of this webinar series depends on your participation. Uh, we have had this series since, since 2013 uh, and we are very proud of, of, of all of our presentations. So please come again. Thank you all of you and I will say goodbye now. Bye-bye. Thank you for your questions. Bye-bye.